Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council's first program of the fall semester. And uh, also welcome to our guest speakers, Peter Gerlach and Catherine Wittnabin. Thanks to Peter and Catherine and to everyone who has joined us online today. I'm sure we'll still have a few people uh, plugging in. And of course, we'll be recording this. Uh, as you know, if you were just on, uh, we've started recording so that people who uh, weren't able to join us can uh, join at a later time. My name is Ty Swinkelblock. I am the president of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council Board of Directors and chair of its fundraising committee and today's program host. We would like to acknowledge and thank our members, sponsors, and partners for their support. This list includes the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs Honors Program and Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, City Channel 4 for providing online access to all ICFRC programs along with the UI Library Archives, and all of our wonderful individual donors and members. The Iowa City Foreign Relations Council has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of our acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. As we get started, I would like to cover, even though some of you might, might be sick of this, uh, some Zoom etiquette tips because meeting to meeting in all of the Zoom meetings that you continue to have, uh, these things uh, vary just a little bit. So for our program today, we'd like to uh, just make sure you know where your video uh, and audio mute buttons, so how to turn on and off your camera, how to turn on and off your microphone. Um, we've already muted everybody during uh, the speaker's comments, so you're, you've already been muted, and in many cases, we've turned off your video for you, um, and that's just so that during our presentation, we don't have interruptions uh, for our speakers, but following our speaker's presentations at about 1245, we want to have a 15-minute Q&A, and just like in the old days when we used to uh, meet for lunch, uh, we collect question cards, uh, only we do that via the online chat. So if you'd submit your questions via the chat function, um, and at that time, I think it's nice for you to turn your video on so everyone can see one another again. Um, but keep your uh, your mute button muted just so that we don't have um, feedback or interference during the question and answer period. It's now my pleasure to introduce Peter Gerlach and Catherine Wittnabin, who will speak about welcoming and supporting refugees and immigrants, making the case for an intentionally inclusive Iowa. Dr. Peter Gerlach is visiting assistant professor in the International Studies Program at the University of Iowa. He received his BA and MA degrees in English from Ripon College in the and the University of Northern Colorado, respectively. After serving in the US Peace Corps in Mongolia, he earned a PhD in Cultural Foundations of Education from Syracuse University, where he conducted dissertation research on the lived experiences of international students at Grinnell College. His teaching areas include international studies, international education, refugee and immigrant studies, and community engaged learning. Dr. Gerlach serves on the International oh. Studies Academic Advisor Fulbright Committee at the University of Iowa and on the board of directors of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, Global Ties Iowa and the Refugee and Immigrant Association. Catherine Wittnabin is Executive Director of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council. She is an international political economist who has worked on economic reform issues in the former Soviet Union and Central and Eastern Europe. 
She has taught international relations and economics at universities in the United States and Sweden. She has worked on international economic issues for two committees in the U.S. House of Representatives, and she has most recently served as Vice President for Advancement at the University of, West, of the West of Scotland near Glasgow, Scotland. Please join me in uh, a warm welcome to our two speakers today, Peter Gerlach and Catherine Whitnaman. Over to you two. Thank you, Tice. I also want to introduce uh, Madison Black. Um, who's with us today. So Madison, hello. Madison's a second year MPA student at the University of Iowa where she received her BA in political science with highest distinction and honors in the major in May of 2022. She was the lead researcher and writer for the report on refugees and immigrants in Iowa. So she's going to be here with us just for a short time because she's in between classes. Um, she has class in a little while. So I think we'll start by talking to Madison if that's okay with you, Peter, and get Madison's input on this. Um, yeah. Today's a big day for us at ICFRC. Um, we've completed this project on refugees and immigrants in Iowa, and today we released the report, which we will talk about in a little while. We have the print copy, and it's gone live on our website now, so we'll be talking about this, but Madison and Peter were the writers of this, and it's an amazing report, so I thank you both so much. So Madison, I just wanted to talk to you because you were the lead intern on this, working on the project, and you've been an intern with ICFRC since 2019, so you have had a lot of experience with us and we're really grateful for all of your hard work. We're really proud of you also for your graduation with distinction and for your now MPA program. Um, when you received this ability to work on the project with us, what was that experience like for you working on this project? Uh, I was really excited when I first found out that we were even doing the project because um, I've been studying immigration for like all four years of my undergrad degree. And I'm now spending time with my master's degree studying immigration as well. Um, so having the opportunity to uh, research and think about immigrants and refugees who are coming here to Iowa was uh, really great. So um, what did you, sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, what did you learn from working on the project? I learned a lot about uh, immigration and refugees from like Europe and Asia specifically. Uh, previously, I'd spent a lot of my time um, thinking about immigrants from South and Central America. And obviously this project took a much wider scope than that. So that was really interesting for me. Um, I also learned a lot about the actual process of becoming a refugee. I hadn't spent very much time researching that before. So uh, thinking about that, learning about all the resources that are actually available for refugees here in Iowa, but also, you know, where there are some gaps in those resources was really interesting as well. So I also want to talk a little bit about your senior thesis, because you did a senior thesis looking at meatpacking plants and the issues around worker safety and immigration and so forth. Would you want to talk a little bit about your thesis for a minute? And then also, how did that relate to the project? Yeah, so I spent all of last year doing research on the meatpacking industry in Iowa and how to protect immigrants and refugees in that industry. Um, so I'm sure most of us are familiar with the way that COVID kind of uh, ran rampant through the industry. Um, there was the case of the Tyson plant where the managers were actually placing bets on who was going to get COVID. Um, it was really sad and uh I had family who worked in the meatpacking industry. Um, I grew up in a meatpacking town, so it was a problem that was really close to me personally. Um, and so I spent a year doing some research on sort of the history of the industry, um, thinking about in like the early 20th century when there were some more protections put in place and how those have kind of eroded and brought us to where we are today. Uh, what else? So it ended with me basically recommending the repeal of the right to work law so that we could increase union membership, which would help um, bring voices to people who may not be able to sort of advocate for themselves on their own. Um, I, in another project, also looked at the EU visa, which is a special type of visa that's meant to protect victims of violent crime. Um, it was originally made with the intention of protecting victims of domestic crime. Uh, but in my research, I looked at the potential to use it for victims of workplace crime in the meatpacking industry. Um, there are cases of 
executives on these plans going in recruiting people from Central and South America under false pretenses, uh, bringing them back here and making them work in conditions and for wages that are not what they were promised. Um, there are all sorts of horrible cases of things that have happened in the industry. And it's just a really major problem because so many people in this workforce are people who are either here undocumented and thus are afraid to speak up because if they do, then their manager can report them and they'll be sent out of the country. Um, or they are here just as an immigrant, as a refugee, maybe don't know the language as well, don't know what their sort of resources or ways to advocate for themselves are. Um, and then it intersected with this project because obviously I was looking at, you know, immigrant and refugee populations in both projects, but also by the time we got to the final program where we were talking about um, how immigrants and refugees affect public policy, a really common theme between all of the towns um, that we heard from was that they were all meatpacking towns. So what you find in Iowa is that towns with these big meatpacking plants are going to be some of the most diverse towns here. That, that, that's a really I apologize for the noise. For the that's okay. Noise. I think we're okay. I think everybody's gonna be able to hear you. Um, well, so for, for more for, for those of you who want to learn more about Madison's report, there's actually a link to her report on meatpacking plants in the report on refugee and immigrants. So the link's there, and you can read Madison's great report in its entirety. But I think it's an important point that we talked a lot about meatpacking plants and towns that are that are hosting them and what that looks like for these towns. So we'll talk a little more about that in the program. But I want to thank you again. Is there anything else you want to add or share with us before you go to class? Um, I don't think so. Well, thanks again for your great work. This was a really, I had a great time working on this project um, and I learned a lot. <laughs> well, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Peter, this is a big day for us here at ICFRC. It sure it. is completed a big in-depth series of programs that we've never done before. We've done a, the first project report, which we've never done before. First funding from Humanities Iowa and National Endowment for Humanities, and we're very grateful to them for their support. Um, so what was the impetus for doing this project? Yeah, boy, it really sounds like we've been busy, huh? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think um, before I answer your question, or in you know, part of a way to answer your question is, uh, you know, to engage our our interns or uh, the students that work with the IACFRC more. I think it's so fabulous what uh, Madison just described. I mean, she's an incredible student mm -hmm. and I feel really fortunate to have uh, taught her in the spring in a course uh, that I teach at the university. Uh, and so in part, I mean, I think we have these incredible interns and so to give them also a project like this one where they can really shine uh, was part of the impetus uh, for for doing this project. Uh, in broader terms, uh, I think the ICFRC has such capacity to do this kind of work, right? And we, we really showed it. Uh, we already have a really broad network and we partly wanted to reach a much wider audience across the state. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have to give you credit for this, Catherine. Uh, you know, this was was your vision, and you you know asked me if I would be the project director, and I said, "Sure, Catherine, I'll do anything you say." <laughs> uh, so uh, I mean, I think it's it's really your brainchild, and together and with this great team that we had, uh, we really made this incredible thing happen. It has its roots in. Uh, a course that I teach uh, in the spring at the university. And I know we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, but, you know, we have done some programs in the past uh, that have focused on refugees and immigrants uh, or immigration in the US or maybe uh, further away. But with this, with this project, the impetus was really to showcase uh, the ways in which we are all Iowans. Uh, and it's really hard to do that sort of thing unless it's done with uh, a lot of moving parts, I would say, many programs. How do we really accurately uh, show that? It's hard to do in one program. Uh, 
Um, but over the course of time, uh, it can be done really well. And, uh, you know, a part of the impetus was also reaching out and connecting with more of our amazing neighbors across the state. I mean, just think of all the incredible people that were speakers in this program. The, it's been a real treat for me to be able to talk with them, to engage in conversation, the kind of conversations I really want to have. And that I think also we want our audience, right? We want folks in the ICFRC to have also. So the impetus was to also expand uh, the, the sort of scope of thought around these issues, around the real life experiences of refugees and immigrants, so that folks who attend our sessions, which uh, we were able to, uh, I think, grow our, our audiences, that they too would really get to hear directly from folks. I'm a big believer that we all need to do a whole lot more listening than we do talking. Although I think I'm sometimes really bad with that. Like right now I'm really going on and on. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, from an audience's perspective, us thinking about who attends our sessions, part of the impetus was how do we have a much larger conversation that matters to all of us because it really does, because refugees and immigrants are our neighbors in every community that we live in across the state. Well, I think that, that's a great explanation. I think from my perspective, um, coming back to Iowa in the fall of 2020 from the United Kingdom, refugees and immigration are a big issue in the United Kingdom as well as all across Europe and internationally, of course. And so I had started learning a lot about how the United Kingdom handled it and coming back into my home state of Iowa because I am from Iowa, I grew up here. I was interested in how Iowa was responding. You know, I, I was you know, grew up where Robert Ray, the Governor Ray really started bringing in more refugees and immigrants and we became very open as a state. So I was sort of interested in how did we build on that history and legacy that we had with being very welcoming and what did that look like now? And so I was so thrilled to meet you because this was an area you were passionate about fit in with your course, which we'll talk a little bit more about but I also thought it was a great opportunity for this organization to really expand its outreach. Um, it's something that we've been really committed to doing is being more inclusive and more diverse as an organization. And I think, you know, we raise the voices of refugees and immigrants in this process. So what do you see as the goals that we had? And do you think we achieved those goals? Yeah, uh, to help me answer this, uh, I'd like to share my screen so that we can also showcase this amazing website that uh, Carlisle uh, put together, the ICFRC's program assistant. Along with um, our interns. She had a lot of intern help too. She sure did. You're, you're absolutely right about that. Um, so if you go to the ICFRC website, you can see at the very top, there is now this tab, Refugees and Immigrants in Iowa, which is an amazing sort of showcase of the, the project itself. Uh, and you can see here a general description of the project uh, as well as the goals of the project. So, uh, you know, if we look at these here, uh, you know, a deeper understanding. Yes, I think for all of these things here, the, the real goals have been to, uh, to make more possible, uh, more Iowans across the state having a deeper understanding of the, the, the issues uh, that matters to refugees and immigrants as well as to learn firsthand from those folks. Um, we have uh, tried to, you know, one of our goals was to have as many partners as possible. Uh, and I'll admit that was challenging at times and how to be truly inclusive to folks across the state. That, that too was, was challenging. Um, uh, but I think we really achieved that also. Um, so, uh, I would say that we we have. Uh, you mentioned um, our goal of being uh, more intentionally, and, and this is how we come to the, the word, you know, intentionally inclusive, uh, of being an organization that is more intentional in its work, um, more intentional in its mission. And so a year ago, perhaps, I think it was, we, we rewrote or we wrote a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement that was very conscious in how we would proceed from that point forward. And this project 
is a direct manifestation of that. So what does it mean to be intentionally inclusive? Um, I'll touch on that a little bit more. But part of it was, who do we pick as speakers? What kinds of conversations do we have? Uh, and what do we do with, with that information? What are our hopes for it? So I think we have, uh, in some ways, I think, more than achieved our goals. But, or maybe I should say, and we need to keep going, right? Uh, the, the programs are not, um, they're not in the past, although we've, you know, we've already done them. I continue to hear from folks uh, that they're using the programs. I take great pride in this, that they're using the ICFRC's programs in classes, for example. Uh, I was at Cornell College uh, class visit on Friday last week. And the reason I was there is because the instructor of that course said, I saw the ICFRC programs and really want you to come, you know, talk to the class, uh, tell us a little bit more. And I thought, yes, exactly, right? Like this is, uh, this is amazing. This is the reach that the ICFRC can have, but more importantly, the students in that class, uh, they, they watched uh, two programs. The first one in, in preparation for my visit that they watched was uh, reading and writing the refugee and immigrant experience. They heard directly from those folks. Uh, we had amazing speakers in that, an incredible conversation uh, about what it means to uh, represent others, about what it means to share your own stories, sometimes in very vulnerable terms. Um, and so, yes, I think the program continues to do its good work. And it's my hope that the, uh, the, the project itself and how many people we had uh, joining the sessions will continue to have those conversations. Um, so we've met our goals. You've said that Humanities Iowa is happy. It's always good to make the funder happy, right? <laughs> uh, so another, another uh, goal achieved, um, but the work really does continue. Um, and it's my hope that more and more people do see that they have a part to play. Uh, everyday Iowans have a part to play in um, creating the kinds of communities that we all want to live in. Thank you for that. I mean, I think from my perspective, programmatically, I think it was very successful. Um, organizationally, I think it was successful. And I'm hoping that our audience will have some comments to us too, because I know a lot of people that are on with us today have seen a lot of the programs and have participated with us and also help support these programs. So we're grateful for that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to say about that page? Well, there's a lot here. Um, you know, there's a lot of great stuff. As I mentioned, uh, all six programs, we did six starting in December of uh, 21 and went through May of this year. And all of them are here. You can uh, connect directly to them. Uh, watch again, uh, share uh, with others uh, these incredible conversations that we had. Uh, and then towards the bottom, you know, ways to get involved. Uh, truly one of the goals uh, of the program, which I, I didn't highlight a moment ago, uh, was, to, uh, was to endorse, um, was to make uh, more knowledgeable folks uh, the work that's being done around the state by incredible organizations, particularly um, NGOs, and I might add, uh, especially ECBOs or ethnic community-based organizations, which are organizations uh, fully or mostly run by refugees and immigrants themselves. Uh, so in the support and learn more options here, you can, um, you can learn ways that you can get involved. Uh, if we have inspired people to not only have conversations about the impact that they can make, everyone can make an impact. Um, if we can get people to volunteer, uh, if we can get people to uh, donate their, their time, their money, uh, if we can get people to influence others, influence in the uh, most positive ways, of course, um, then I think, I think the work continues on. And it, 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 and it needs to. Um, 
we've all seen that in, in real ways. Um, and these programs certainly highlight that as well. So I think it's time to talk about the report because the lessons that we learned really are in the report. So yeah. what would you like to highlight from what we learned? Because I know I learned a great deal um, mm -hmm. from these sessions. Yeah, uh, let me stop sharing my screen and then let me reshare my screen because part of, uh, I think what's really great about the report uh, is, um, hold on one second. I'm terrible with this. <laughs> I think you're better uh, at it than I am. What's that? And you're better at it than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give me too much credit. Um, okay. So the report, which you uh, you shared, you showed us the hard copy of here. It, it really came out beautifully. Um, yeah, it really came out beautifully. And so uh, maybe it's a bit longer than we would have liked. We talked a lot about keeping it as short as possible. But, you know, in the true spirit of, of reports, sometimes they get a little long. Um, but, uh, you know, we as you can see, there's uh, there's really a, a lot here. Um, and you ask me, what did we learn from this? Uh, I would point specifically to uh, what page 34. Um, I wish there was a faster way to do that. So uh, I'll just do it this way. <laughs> we, in each of the, you can see here, I, I referenced uh, writing and reading about the refugee and immigrant experience. In each of uh, these, we give a description of what the program was about and who the speakers were. Uh, and if we had them, some of the, uh, the references, uh, the specific primary sources that we, uh, that we refer to, that we, we used to talk. Um, if you go towards the end, uh, here are those great spotlights that Madison was talking about and, and uh, her paper. Um, I would direct folks to the key impacts and outcomes of the series. And part of uh, what we decided to do is, uh, you know, we had sort of three key outcomes, right? First, as we say here for Iowa to be its most productive and welcoming individuals, families, institutions, communities, and governments, the local and state levels must be intentionally inclusive. Uh, I touched on that, that uh, you know, that sort of term before. Uh, and you can read here more about that. Second, uh, embracing the belief we are all Iowans, uh, which we heard many, many times across the programs, and enacting intentionally inclusive policies, laws, and values not only demonstrates our shared humanity, but it will lead to collective understanding of Iowa's growth and prosperity. Um, and a third, and the place I really wanted to get to, to answer your question here, uh, there are plentiful examples currently happening in Iowa, the kind of intentionality needed from all of us from which we can learn and put into practice ourselves. So um, in each of the programs, we, we learn directly from folks who are really, I mean, in uh, concrete ways, in incredible ways, in some cases, making a difference in their communities. And there's a list here of all the ways that that's happening, uh, you know, from, from big things and from small things, right? Sometimes we suppose, I suppose we think that, you know, making a difference has to be a grand statement, uh, has to be um, on a big scale. And it, it really doesn't sometimes. Um, but it happens in all these really amazing ways. Um, you can see here, the list is quite long. Um, just one that pops off the page for me uh, is that we have learned throughout this program uh, the, sorts of, um, the sorts of ways that Iowans are going out of their way, are being intentional themselves to create uh, workplaces to create communities, home lives that welcome and support refugees. So I remember one, Catherine, you probably remember this one, West Liberty Foods, right? They reached out to us. Uh, we were in the, in, somewhere in the middle of doing this uh, program series and asked if we had any suggestions about how they could support this group, um, this small group, of, I think it was like a dozen or 15 
recently arrived Afghan refugees about how they could create an inclusive work workplace. Um, that's really incredible. And it doesn't, that was an, an effort of recognition within the organization in order to support, support individuals who would be working there and reaching out to us, another organization to say, what ideas do you have? Which led to conversations with and training from the Catholic Macaulay Center. Um, that's just one example. Do you, you remember this one, Catherine? No, I do. I remember that uh, the, the woman from West Liberty Foods called me. They were getting all these Afghan refugees in, and, and they were being really intentional about how they were going to welcome these people. And one of the things she told me was, you know, these refugees that were coming in were doctors and lawyers, and they'd been military interpreters, and, and they were going into now working into, into a food processing plant, right, a meat processing plant. And most of them were Muslim. And she said, how do we, how do, we do this well? And they were having trainings internally in the, inside West Liberty Foods to figure out how do they treat these people well? How are they going to deal with them? A lot of them, some of them had good English, some of them didn't. And all of them had basically had to leave their homes in Afghanistan. So it was mostly men coming at that time. And how are they going to help support them? So it was a wonderful experience in connecting them with Catherine McCauley Center and having training done. So, I, you know, I, kudos to everybody involved. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we... We learned uh, across the programs that people are doing uh, quite a bit, right? That there is, um, I don't wanna use the word consensus necessarily, um, but there is a, a general and broad belief that Iowans um, are friendly. Iowans are nice and welcoming. Uh, and we know the data bears out that Iowa is increasingly becoming a place where refugees, immigrants, uh, asylum seekers, um, international folks of all stripes want to move to. Why? Um, well, because Iowa is uh, a place where jobs can be more plentiful, uh, where uh, despite our, our winters, uh, which many folks talk about the difficulty of winters, where they can find a place to live. There, over the course of time, many communities have, uh, have moved to Iowa. Uh, they also find that uh, the school districts are good here, despite what we learned uh, in our session on education, that there's a lot more work to do. Um, that the ties that have already been created and are being created, uh, including um, so many of these organizations that go well out of their way, are making Iowa become a place where more and more folks want to move, uh, despite the difficulties, including the difficulties, which exists everywhere, really. Um, we know that uh, we all need to do a lot more work uh, myself included, um, about uh, how to make Iowa intentionally inclusive. And I would argue that, uh, and I sort of do in, in this report, um, that uh, we have to do this in part through conversation. Um, that's one of the, the most important things that I have learned and one of the things I appreciate most about this project it's all based around discussion, right? In these programs, hearing from others, having an open platform to discuss. Sometimes uh, the tensions, right? Um, some of our guests were not happy the way things are. And collectively we shouldn't be, right? There's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, there's a lot more that our state can be doing. Um, but overall, you know, as we say here, uh, what the report has done, what the project has done more broadly, is be yet another demonstration of the fact that every person's story matters. Their voice matters. And we're better off when we're a diverse state and when we're a diverse communities. Um, we learned a lot. We really, really learned a lot by listening.
Well, the thing I like about the report and all of you, you, all you have to do is even go to the homepage. There's a link on our homepage. So you just go to the homepage of icfrc.org and, and you go, link takes you right to the report. One of the things that every section they talked about ref, recommendations, you know, what people could do. And I think the public policy session on May 4th brought four towns up and highlighted four towns, Columbus Junction, Marshalltown, Storm Lake, and West Liberty, and how they're addressing the increasing diversity in their communities and lessons they have for all of us that we could replicate across the state and across the country, actually, which I thought was really useful. But every program had things that they they recommended about how we could improve education and access to through FAFSA, how we could, you know, work, help with housing and transportation and medical care. I mean, so I think there's a lot of richness here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were given a lot of specifics. Uh, yeah. It was really fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping people read this and take it to heart. We will, of course, be sharing this with our with our governor and, and state legislators and members of Congress and so forth, um, policymakers who are in position to learn and, and do things with this, which I think is mm -hmm. wonderful. So what do you see as the next steps for us in supporting refugees and immigrants? Well, I really think it's the work that we all need to do. The conversations need to continue to happen. Um, you know, it's uh, it's my hope that the ICFRC uh, will continue to do programs that highlight uh, refugee and immigrant stories, uh, experiences, issues. Um, and uh, as I as we've just talked about, I mean, the report shows all the ways that this is happening. Um, all the re the real, uh, the very impactful things that communities are doing. Um, but I would say that um, there's just a whole lot more that we can be doing. If I think of one example, uh, it's Vin Nguyen discussing education mm -hmm. for ESL learners uh, in, in Des Moines. <clears throat> he was specifically talking about Des Moines, but uh, if Des Moines has the kind of challenges that he described, we know that those challenges exist in many places across our state. Um, and he spoke with such uh, passion um, and such clarity about how much more work needs to be done, uh, that the services, uh, the programs, that, for example, uh, Mallory Pesch talked about with at Kirkwood, um, there needs to be a whole lot more of those kinds of programs, right? Because if we think about children, uh, if we think about what young, our youngest, newest Iowans need, they need foundations from which to really learn and grow. And uh, I would say that we need folks to really hear what people like Vin are telling us. And we need to really listen to what Mallory described as being the, the positives. And Rocio, a student herself, describing uh, the benefits for students like herself, and her classmates, receiving the kinds of services and programs that would make her a successful student. And as you know, she so eloquently told us, you know, diversity being key um, to a brighter future for herself and others. Um, so there's, I mean, this is just one example, um, but uh, I think we all need to learn better, learn more, and then have conversations about how we can impact those changes. For example, what could we say to our, what could we bring to our um, our school boards. What kinds of changes do we know English language learners uh, need to have to be able to thrive? And how do programs like that make the entire school better, make our community stronger? Uh, those are conversations that we can all be having. And those there are impacts that we can all be having in different ways. Uh, someone who doesn't feel like they want to get out and, and volunteer be on the front line, so to speak, can think about ways that um, maybe their dollars can make an impact, or they have friends of influence uh, within their communities who can, uh, who can bend ears, who can be brave voices, uh, who can uh, have conversations in their backyards with teachers, uh, 
about how to be more intentionally inclusive, how to be more culturally responsive. Uh, so, yeah, I think those are a few things I would say. I'm very passionate about education. It's uh, it's, it's it's my my primary field of of uh, education and training and experience. Uh, it was certainly my favorite of the programs. But the way Vin sort of lit that fire, uh, being in the Des Moines public school system for 30 years, um, that's the kind of perspective that I think we can all have. Uh, we can gain from a series like this one. And we have through the internet and we have in languages that didn't even exist when I was in college, a kind of openness, inclus inclusivity, a kind of appreciation for diversity and truly culturally responsive uh, practices that will lead to these really important uh, cultural changes within our schools and in our neighborhoods. Um, so maybe that's just one example. Well, speaking of your passion for education, you also teach a course on this and you drew a lot on your course to do this project series. Do you wanna talk anything about your course? Or well, I'm between your course and what you what you did with the project. Yeah, so a lot of you know what we did with the the project, the refugees and immigrants uh, in Iowa series. Uh, some of the same folks uh, that were speakers uh, have been speakers in my course, and I think the thing that I, I I'll say here is that I consider that course to be a shared teaching model. Uh, they are there, I remind them all at the beginning of the semester as, uh, as instructors, as people whose, um, whose experience matters and who are experts themselves. Uh, despite me being the lead instructor of the course, I'm actually not the expert. I would argue that each of them are and the perspectives that they bring to the students that I could not. And in chorus, um, we hope to educate the students more, make them more knowledgeable, and to hopefully uh, get them to, uh, to volunteer in their communities. The uniqueness about that course is that it's a community engaged learning course or service learning as it uh, was more commonly called in previous years. Um, and so the students do group projects uh, in order to put into action all that they've learned over the course of the semester. And they were inspired too, I think, by hearing directly from refugees and immigrants, semester after semester, when I asked them what's the most impactful part of the course, they say, hearing directly from people uh, who have shared their lived experiences. And so when I thought about the, the, uh, the series, I thought about some of these incredible people that have uh, and continue uh, each year to uh, to be speakers in my course about that shared teaching model, and that it's not just about you know one person uh, sharing their own experience, but what happens when you put several people in conversation with one another? What kind of learning happens then? The multiple perspectives that you get, the new ways of understanding. And hopefully you get a bit uncomfortable with some of the things that they've shared and saying, is this the kind of world I want to live in? Um, can I be doing more myself? Uh, what more do I need to be sharing with others so that I can make an impact? And it turns out I really can make an impact. Uh, so, you know, some of those things really carried over into the, into the series. And I'm really grateful for some of the speakers who have been in both. And M Madison, for example, being a student in the course and, and coming on to the project in a significant way too. Um, yeah, she was uh, she was amazing in both. <laughs> we can keep talking, but I'd like to open up for questions. So if you have questions for Peter or me or Tice or anybody here that um, you'd like to put in the chat, that would be great. So we... Um, and we'll just, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, Peter, we, we recommended a lot of resources and things that people could read and they could watch. They're on our website. They're also in the back of the course. Anything particular you'd like to draw people's attention to? Um, yes. Um, so uh, I can uh, quickly, or maybe not so quickly, uh, I can share with you what uh, Catherine is referring to so that you can see this after we, after we depart. Uh, you can see exactly what we're talking about. 
If you go to the website, there is, at the very bottom of that main refugees and immigrants in Iowa page, there is a box that says read and watch. Uh, and so there are several really great resources here. Being a UNESCO city of literature, there are a lot of readers in the room. Uh, and I have uh, pointed out here, uh, share uh, some some uh, really great uh, pieces. Now, I think that as we uh, highlighted during the programs, I would strongly recommend the We the Interwoven series. Uh, incredible books. If that's one place to start, uh, I, I would start there. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Dina Niari's work and The Ungrateful Refugee uh, will, uh, it will pull your brain in ways, in really good ways uh, and make you uncomfortable. This notion of gratefulness is one that many refugees are told they should have. They should be grateful that they're here in the US. Uh, and so what does that really mean? What does that look like? Uh, she really explores that. Um, here are some of the books. Uh, images of the books. And then we have a number of films uh, here that one could watch as well. I think if I were going to uh, recommend one, there's also a list here towards the bottom. Uh, it's a little harder to get, I recognize, uh, but I, I put it on here um, because I found it incredibly impactful. Again, it's about students. It's about a school in New York City. I Learn America, um, this incredible documentary. Uh, one that's probably a little bit easier to find and will really give you uh, a stark understanding, stark images of what's happening around the United States is Immigration Nation, uh, a 2020 documentary series on Netflix. Um, I show Human Flow, which is an incredibly beautiful, uh, incredibly tragic, uh, global, I mean, truly international documentary. Uh, anyway, on and on I could go. There's uh, there are a lot of great resources here. So check out this page and yes, do learn more because there is so much to learn. We have some questions. Our first question is, what is our next project going to be? Peter, you're also program committee chair. Do you want to take that? This thing we're talking about a lot right now. Yeah, well, it's really your idea, Catherine. So maybe I should let you talk about it. Um, but hopefully building off of the success of of this series uh we we really we don't just believe we know we can do a really high quality uh program series and so the next one Catherine, uh, at least what we're, we're what we're thinking about works yeah we're exploring so when we did the surveys of all of our members and friends last year, we got a lot of input. And I, I'd love to have you continue to give us input on what you'd like us to do an in-depth series about. So just email us at icfrc.org. Um, but um, we're looking, and we ask our interns, what, and for students, global climate change is a really huge issue. And we had a really great presentation this last year from Dr. Jerry Schnorr and Stadis Giannakouros talking about the inequities of global climate change. And so we're thinking about doing an in-depth series on the equities of global climate change and the impact on Iowa. But we have to find the right project director. Peter's really difficult to replace. Um, and we need to find someone else with that level of experience and passion and commitment to doing this with us. So we're looking for exploring that right now. Um, but I think we have seen that. I think doing an in-depth series at least attracts all of you. I, I, we appreciate all of you for doing this with us. Um, I think. From my perspective, we've reached out across the state in ways we've never done that before. We've worked with so many new program partners in our community, um, which has been wonderful for us. And, and, and it's, it's shown us how we can build more partnerships, which is really critical, I think, to addressing all these issues. So we'll see, but if you have any comments, just send them to us or put them in the chat because we explore what we might wanna do next for the in-depth program series. And if you have any ideas about global climate change, that would be great too. So we have another question now, are the experiences of refugees and immigrants changing as politics change? Does this call for different responses by local resources? Well, uh, you know, I would say uh, first and foremost that one of the things that Mark Suchaska always tells me and it always tells my students is it does not matter who is in public office. It doesn't matter if they are Republicans or Democrats, that the, the work is imperative and the services that are offered um, are, are the same. 
And I, I really think that that's accurate. And I trust so much in Mark Suchewski's work. Uh, I trust so much uh, in, in what he shares. Uh, as Catherine pointed out, um, Governor Ray, uh, you know, despite this being you know, many decades ago, was a Republican. Um, and so I think that in many ways, refugees and immigrants' lives have, um, have gotten better, uh, have gotten easier, but it's a challenging experience. Uh, communities really are the lifeblood. Ethnic community-based organizations are probably the single most impactful uh, group of people because they've had the experiences themselves. Uh, and they know firsthand what newcomers really do need. Um, so local resources, yes. Uh, most of the needed impact comes at the local level. We can't look to, we can't rely on, uh, you know, what those in office in Des Moines um, might be able to do for us today and tomorrow. We want to impact public policy for sure. We want to uh, try and um, make sure that Iowa is intentionally inclusive in law and policy. Uh, but the real difference and the way that we uh, way that we continually do better and more right by refugees and immigrants is what we do as individuals. And we have a language, we have more resources, uh, we have a knowledge base, including what we've done with the ICFRC, that can help make that happen. So some things are the same, uh, some things are different. So another question, which we sort of touched upon, but we can maybe expand upon is how can we support the children of refugees and immigrants? And I was struck by a couple of our speakers who talked about children have to become the intermediaries oftentimes between their parents and, and the rest of society if their parents don't speak English, for example, and how difficult that's been for them. Is there anything else you wanna say here about supporting children? Well, we need, uh, as I touched on before, uh, we need uh, the kinds of services and programs that don't really exist in our schools. Um, even in places where you, uh, where you might think, you know, there are a lot of English language learners there. So there's real support for those students. Um, maybe if, you know, for no other reason, then there, there must be, right? Because uh, in order to, uh, to really support those students, they do need to be able to navigate the school system, which is really, really complicated. Uh, think about the challenges that we've all had going through our, uh, our school systems, wherever they might have been. But yes, uh, there is additional work that happens in, or I should say, between home life and school life. Uh, and so part of what the TRIO, uh, the TRIO program, the TRIO ESL program at, at Kirkwood Community College does, is it looks at these, uh, at the students and at the families holistically and says, well, you know, students can't really be successful in school unless they are also too successful in their home lives. Uh, and so we need, you know, far more programs like that. We need them much earlier on. And that I believe was the real message that we received from the, the session we did on education is that that's great. Uh, Kirkwood's doing an incredible job with this and programs like that need to exist, but they need to start in elementary school. Um, that's where we need to start making things happen right away. And so that, uh, making that sort of impact is bringing that to your local school boards um, and maybe even referencing, this is the kind of thing that Kirkwood does. Uh, what would it take for us to achieve some of those things by looking at the programs that they have? So we have time for one more question. We have a question here that I know it's hard for both you and I to answer because we've been asking this question um, for the state, but it's, can you give us an estimate of how many immigrants have recently come into Iowa? So we know the scope of the opportunity. And you and I have been <laughs> talking with Max Suchewski and other people about this probably for a year. Yeah, um, that's really tough to say. You know, we do give some numbers in the report, uh, but it's important to note that uh, you know, statuses change uh, very often. 
uh, the aspiration of most folks uh, when they come in, uh, say a refugee is to become a citizen or a permanent resident. And so statuses are, co are constantly changing. There is also something known as secondary migration, which means that folks, if they are, you know, if they come from Afghanistan, for example, and they're placed in Iowa, uh, they may have uh, ties in, in other states uh, in California. Uh, and so they may move uh, to that state. And so somebody like Mark Suchaska, uh, I've referenced him before, uh, he is the state refugee coordinator. Um, you know, he, he makes clear that, that these sorts of realities make it really difficult for us to put uh, numbers. Uh, we do know that approximately 1,000 Afghan refugees came to the state of Iowa uh, since uh, the fall of Kabul uh, in 2021. Um, so that's a bit more of a concrete number. And the Afghan community is, they're really, um, they uh, are staying for the most part where they were originally settled because it means for them that they can build community. Because in our state, uh, prior to this happening, there are not many uh, folks from Afghanistan living in Iowa. And so this is one example of where those who are originally settled in Iowa do stay in the place of their original settlement. But I would, uh, I'm hesitant to give any sort of, you know, uh, bigger numbers than that. Well, I thank you so much. I encourage everybody to go and look at the report. I thank all of you for your incredible support for this. While we got the grant from Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for Humanities, we had to match the grant and that was only possible because of the donations of all our supporters and members. So thank you all for allowing us to, to do this and to bring this to you. So I'm gonna turn the program back over to Tice, but thank again so much, Peter. Thank you, Catherine. Yes, and uh, I'm going to just again say thank you to both Peter and Catherine who uh, brought this project to life and made it as successful as it has been. And you know, continues to inform the programming decisions that the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council is making. So uh, just heartfelt uh, thanks for all your hard work. I would offer you an ICFRC mug because this is the moment in the program we do this, but you're got, you, you probably, I think your shelves are lined with ICFRC mugs by now. So uh, we'll forego that, that uh, usual tradition, uh, but really our, our deepest thanks for such an amazing uh, program that uh, has really made a difference. Uh, throughout throughout the state. Um, so um, all of you, I also want to thank you and encourage you to go check out that report at icfrc.org. And thank you to Brett Cloyd for posting the link in the chat function. If you want to go over there and copy and paste that real quickly before we boot you out of Zoom, then uh, now's your chance. Uh, but that's, don't worry, it's not going to be missing. You can find it just directly on our website in a number of different, uh, or at least in two main places on that refugees and immigrants tab, as well as on our homepage. Um, so I will tell you that uh, this is just the first of uh, our programs to come, some of which will be in person and some of which will be on Zoom. So we're gonna continue with our hybrid approach. Um, our next program will be Tuesday, September 13th, next Tuesday at 12 noon. It will be via Zoom, and that will be featuring Dr. Alek Timofeev, who will speak about Ukrainian culture and the war in Ukraine. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to those of you who joined us today. We really couldn't do this without you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a wonderful day.